And when yeah. you start beating the impossible once and twice, you start believing that, you know what? It's a habit. It's, it's a habit. <laughs> so for me, even today, like, you know, I get a lot of no's. I get a lot of people saying that, you know, sure. we don't want to work with you. We don't want to join venture with your business model. It doesn't make sense to me. Right. If I'm pitching my fund to people, a lot of people don't believe in it. Right. For me, that initial no is just a way to get the yes. Welcome Level Uppers, we're here for another episode of the Level Up Blueprints where we talk to entrepreneurs in finance, real estate and fintech about their blueprint to success. Today we have an excellent guest, like all guests, but this one's very specific. So we have uh, Sahil Jaggi and uh, specifically three things to know about Sahil is that first of all, you got into real estate investing quite young. Yeah. You beat the market by 14% the last decade. Yes. Uh, and you have suddenly started to take Decembers off and still put up those numbers, which I'm very curious about. <laughs> and uh, I think all those things start with habits. Right. Right. What are those micro habits that you have on a daily basis? And maybe even some of those longer term goals that somehow maybe influence the habits. That's the first thing I like to start with. So would love to hear about especially for the new decade, what are some habits you're looking into, both short-term and long-term, to get towards that level-up success? Absolutely, and, I, and you know what? Habits didn't just start for me from day one. Yeah. I think it was, uh, you know, it was initially I was very disorganized, I'll be very honest, and I'm not a morning person. Right. As opposed to every <laughs> single thing that you hear on the internet, right. and it's plastered all over the internet, you're gonna start your day at 5 a.m., you gotta sure. do this. I still, to date, do not start my day before 12 o'clock. Believe it or not. Wow. So I'll, I'll wake up around like 10 and the two hours I give to my health and I'll go out and sure. jog and this and that. But I'm a late riser okay. because I work very late. Right, I was going to say. Right? So, and How many hours of sleep do you get? I get about eight hours. Okay, so good. So I'll sleep around like, you know, one or two o'clock. Okay. I'll wait around nine o'clock and I'll start my day, get my breakfast in and hopefully go for a run and do my yoga and do my exercise. Right, but so I mindfulness don't. is important for you. Absolutely. Exercise, you're saying it very like, yeah, it's stable stakes, I do, that's normal for everyone. So, it's not normal for everyone, but obviously, definitely. so if we took those things away from your habits, right. do you think you could function as far as the mindfulness part, the exercise Absolutely part? Absolutely not. Okay. Like, not into my <laughs> optimum, optimum level, right. for that matter. But uh, what I wanted to say is that I don't think that, uh, you know, your absolute 5 a.m. morning routine is something that's so like, I think it's person to person. Mm -hmm. And in real estate, what people don't realize is that you have to work weekends and you have to work evenings, mm -hmm. which is when people are off work. Mm -hmm. And you have to have that optimum level of energy starting mm -hmm. from the way you start all the way to the end, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Between 6 and 10 p.m., I meet a lot of clients. Um, I show a lot of properties. I go out there on the mm -hmm. road. So I have to have that peak level of energy mm -hmm. throughout the day, which is totally. why I start my day late yeah. and I finish my day late. Awesome. Uh, but absolutely, like you, like you said, uh, habits became like as I realized that to become more efficient, you yeah. have to take care of the the machinery, right? So of you course, have to wake up. Course. So I usually wake up around 9 a.m. and I'll uh, do a little like stretches, yoga. I'll listen nice. to some, do some. Uh, Initially, I used to spend a lot of time doing affirmations. Okay, yeah. But now Tony I Robbins is huge on. I don't know if you, if you followed his structure. You know what? what kind of affirmations Funny you mentioned Tony that? Robbins out yeah. of all the people because I don't think anybody right. has influenced me more than Tony Robbins okay. in his entire life. I think I awesome. follow him to the T. Yeah. Um, and one of the yeah, things that I followed him in sales was, uh, you know, mastering influence. That's one of the things that I've read about, you know, when I got into sales and real estate, yeah. I read Mastering Influence and I think that was such an influential thing for me. Right. And uh, absolutely, I think the days that you wake up in a rush and you go out straight to work without doing your affirmation and right. without preparing your mind for that absolute level of peak mm -hmm. performance, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to get the absolute level of, uh, you know, uh, performance. Right. Matter. So I think it's important to wake up, give yourself an hour or two to just get your body in motion, get sure. your mind in motion, sure. and then when you go to work, you're absolutely ready to go. You're at your aching, yeah. you're hitting the ground running, you're not like getting in there, yeah. looking at emails, that's kind right. of waking up no, through like, distractions. Think, and Yeah, and that's what I, same thing I say to, I have a lot of interns working in my office, I have a lot of assistants working in my office. Mm -hmm. For me, I absolutely follow the one mantra is that if you're at work, you got to put in 110% of your energy. Yeah. Otherwise, just take off and don't work. Sure. Right? And the reason why I say that is because it's not just that you owe it to yourself. You also mm -hmm. work with a lot of clients. Totally. And you have and to... And teammates. Leave. Exactly. Clients, teammates, contractors, architects. 
bunch of people that I meet on a daily basis. Sure. And how you walk into the room, how you present yourself, and how, like, you know, the level of conviction that you speak with, mm -hmm. and how the level of energy that you portray, it goes out in the universe and it comes back. Totally. Right? So to me, that uh, that comes with the absolute peak level of state of mind. And yeah. for that, you need preparation every single morning. Yeah. Right? And whether it's morning, it's late morning, or it's the afternoon. It's, sure. My point is, before you start the day, you got to give yourself that one or two hours or even mm. 30 minutes. Sure. To take yourself least. to just get ready. I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, I guess transitioning over to like, when you show up to work at your best, mm -hmm. and people can feel that, and then you you know you're big on social media, right? Perhaps a starting recent to thing, starting, starting to, to yeah. you know, but yeah. you're getting there, right? Yeah. And um, it's clear that there's a certain mindset you want to exude onto others through the, the content that you talk about. What's that mindset that you want people to get from the way they learn about how you do real estate investing, but also just the, the way that you level up as an entrepreneur? Right. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time reflecting actually last December when I was away and I'm like, mm -hmm. how do I become who mm -hmm. I become and how do I get that level of energy? Mm -hmm. And I think it, it comes from my roots. Like I, I was born in Delhi and I, mm -hmm. I wasn't uh, from a very privileged family and mm -hmm. you know it was even for my parents to send me to Canada was a big struggle. Mm -hmm. I came here when I was 16 years old with no family, nothing, I had a right. very distant aunt. And I think from the very get go that I that when I when I sat down with my dad and he's like you're going to Canada, you're going to pursue your education there. Mm -hmm. For me it was a matter of no choice. Right. The fact that you know I'm going to go to Canada and I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing that's really stuck with me and I, when I reflect back is that I always believed that from a very beginning age, like, you know, if you're able to start doing, uh, start defeating the barriers to entry right. into anything. So for example, initially it was a challenge to get into Laurier for School of Business and Economics. Right. When I did that, I got the confidence that I can do that. Sure. From there, I was in finance and I started, uh, and I got a job in Wall Street, mm -hmm. for example, even mm -hmm. with getting B grades by just purely networking and purely right. just reaching out to people. The fact that I got into working with Wall Street, for me, it was like, wow, that's an impossible that I just beat. Sure. And when yeah. you start beating the impossible once and twice, you start believing that, you know what? It's a habit. It's, it's a habit. <laughs> so for me, even today, like, you know, I get a lot of no's, I get a lot of people saying that, you know, sure. we don't want to work with you, we don't want to join venture with you, a business model doesn't make sense to me. Right. If I'm pitching my fund to people, a lot of people don't believe in it right for me that initial no is just a way to get the yes right right and to me that's become a habit as well mm -hmm. which means that uh, every single thing that comes my way if I feel like there's a way to do it there's always going to be a way to achieve it totally it's so it's just a matter of programming your brain to say you know what yeah. I'm not gonna take no for an answer and I'm mm -hmm. going to do everything I can to beat this barrier of entry that's in front of me mm -hmm. because I've consistently done that for the last eight to nine years right to me, it comes naturally and for yeah. me, it's just like if I put my mind to it, it just has to be done. Yeah, you look at the past results, exactly. it's there. Exactly. I, I think people fail to remember how they've broke through past challenges because yeah. they're too stuck up on the first part of this next right. challenge. Right. And there's different parts, of course, you yeah. have to kind of evolve through. Absolutely, and you know, back in the day, I was sleeping in dens, I was sleeping in basements, and you know, I didn't even have a single real estate to my name. And today, right. I own more than 15 properties with awesome. $14 million dollars in Toronto. Like, right. I remember sleeping in that den and saying, you know what, I must have my own real estate right. to sleep in, so I never have to like sleep in people's dens. Yeah. So at that time, it came from a matter of no choice, but yeah. it and some I fire, programmed right? that into my way of living now. Yeah, to and some fire, up. obviously. It's Absolutely. some inspiration to be like, oh, well, when I have even just one or two properties, I'll that's be laughing exactly at this. It. And maybe maybe, maybe there's even parts that you miss about that. That's right. You know, maybe, <laughs> you know, some very kind of raw parts around Absolutely. just like, you know, when you're at the beginning and yeah. there's less responsibility to some degree exactly. and you're a bit more, it's more of an adventure, right? Exactly. So it's about staying stimulated. I like your point around saying now, because that's a uh, transition to the next question. Mm -hmm. um, I find that especially going to 2020, this is the decade of saying no. Yes. Because there's too many options, <laughs> yeah. right? And I think people usually, it's hard to say no because of how someone else might feel about the way you say no. Mm -hmm. So on the topic of saying no, how do you say no? And specifically, is there a way that you say no as to not offend someone? Do you even care about that? And is there a way for you that you say no to yourself when you're being tempted to do something that's not aligned with your values or goals? So two part, Very good with question. people and to yourself. That's an amazing question. I think I'm gonna start by saying, I have taken no's in very different ways. So right. for example, let's let's talk about Canadian business culture. Sure. I think Canadian business culture is a very, uh, well, it's a, like <laughs> highly based on etiquette. It's sure. highly based on, like I worked on Wall too Street. Too polite, where, man. Exactly, people <laughs> are way too polite. 
when I went from uh, studying in Laurier and I went to New York and Wall Street to work, awesome. no meant no and no meant like, you know, in some ways, fuck no. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. And I learned to like start to take that. So when, I, right. when I'm in a position to say no to people, I think for me, I have a very little filter. Yeah. But not to mention that no just doesn't mean no period. Right. If you say no to someone, I think you can say no, but it should also be followed up by an explanation as to why you're saying no. Right. So for me, it's not that hard to say no because I've received a lot of no's. Right. So maybe I have a little or almost zero uh, because I believe in time efficiency. I believe in prioritizing things. Right. I believe in uh, like, you know, just if a person should get why I'm saying no. Sure. And if it comes and backs up with a good reason, yeah. I think they'll understand and it's better for them and better for me not to waste any time. Totally. So for me, uh, it's also, uh, I mean, of course there's, a way to say no in a way that you know what this is the reason why I'm saying no and this is the reason why I'm not want to pursue you right versus just saying no and not following up with any reasoning yeah or ghosting right. someone exactly. which doesn't help the so culture I think if you at follow all right up with, a, with a reasonable uh, sure. answer or something like that it's it, people don't take offense to it they actually appreciate it mm -hmm. and in some ways it's almost that they need to hear it right. to make their business model a little bit more sharpened right so you right? get your own it's almost giving no in service of them exactly or in, showing in them cases, the way right? that it's no today but it doesn't mean that it's no tomorrow. exactly right, right? and also Leave about aligning open. people mm -hmm. so if you think that you want to say no in a way that you want them to come back to you with something else you say look it's a no today but it doesn't mean it's a no tomorrow right i just need this to be a little bit more refined and the reason why I'm saying no is because of X, Y, Z. Yeah. So I think if that makes sense, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's better to say that rather than beating around the bush. And 100%. I think people need to incorporate that a little bit more into the Canadian business culture mm. in order to just prevail with efficiency a little bit more. Yeah. Sense. I think that's key. And also I know yeah. Grant, who's you know, of yeah. course, yeah. and uh, Grant Finley shares, guy, you know, yeah. yeah, the way he answered uh, that was in, in relation also to his, his, uh, his colleagues who are asking him for different things, different yeah. shiny ideas, and he always says, not now. Right. It's not a no, it's a not now, which is, you know, exactly. very line of the, exactly. the way you're describing it. Exactly. Now, how about no to yourself? That's maybe even a harder thing, is when you, there's always so many temptations, so many options, you do your goal setting, you're fairly set right. on getting somewhere. What's the way that you stay on track? And at what point do you say, you know what? I'm changing my mind. I have enough information for me to suddenly pursue that. Right. Big See, question, but if you can distill it into just absolutely. a few different, you know, timbits. So for me, like I have grown in my business through hustling. Right? Uh -huh. For me, it's the persistence, the perseverance, and the hustle. I'm with you when I that. see that in another person, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. For sure. When I see that lacking in another person, for me, it's a no. Right? right. For example, if somebody comes to me and I know that there hasn't been enough effort. So let me give you an example of interns, for example. Sure. I do a lot of mentoring. I'm teaching in Ted School of Rogers, Rogers That's Business awesome. School yeah. in Ryerson. I'm teaching in Shrulik School of Business mm -hmm. now. And I get tons of people texting me on LinkedIn and email. Right. And, hey, I want to do internship with you. Sure. For me, like it's almost like I say no in order to see if the, how they take it. Of course, yeah. Right? When will they follow up? Exactly. Yeah. And I think this is also lacking in a lot of millennials. When you say right. no to them once, for them it's like, hey, it's a reason, it's almost like an excuse uh -huh. that they can't work with him because he said no. Right. For me, I've got to see that hustle, I've got to see that energy totally. come right back and say... The interview starts so when they reach out exactly. to you, basically, right? It's a no today, <laughs> but how can I make it a yes tomorrow? Sure. So when I see that a person with that kind of energy, that kind of spark, yeah. for me, I invite that into my life. Sure. Any kind of positive energy, any kind of like, hustle, any kind of like persevered person that's, you can tell in their energy wants to be where you, where you got, how you got there. For me, it's easy enough to say yes later. Right? Yes. So that's the way to do it. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and do you want to talk a bit on how you do goal setting, by the way? I know Absolutely. that's a, is there a certain... So I've highly placed a lot of like, uh, you know, um, essence on starting to goal prep. For me, the number one uh, thing is your short-term goals right. have to align with your long-term goals. Right. That's needless to say. Right. And for me, long-term goals goes as far as five to six years. Uh -huh. I don't set 10 to 25-year goals because right. in real estate- Oh, I look at this. Oh, that's awesome. What Thank do we you. have here? Superman. 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 Yeah. Yum. Thank you. one of your chili paste? Thank you. <laughs> Cut that on camera. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, I think the long-term goal always has to be aligned with the short-term goals, but I also feel like in a place like real estate, which is ever-changing, Yeah. Setting goals for like 10, 20 years apart, it mm -hmm. almost becomes like a dream or a wish. Sure. For me to be realistic, I plan five to six years. And I make okay. sure that my short-term goals, which are my one-year goals, yeah. short down to my one-month goals, and uh -huh. my one-week goals, and my daily goals are all aligned. Right. So if I wake up in the morning and I'm doing something daily, it has to align with the next one month. 
and the next one year, and hence the next five years. And do you have a physical reminder to show you that? Do you go on an Excel doc? How do you actually reinforce that Funny daily? enough, I actually have a diary that I scribble in just like that. Ah, perfect. So I, I scribble goals. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a hand writer yep. from, from Dre. Like, you know, I, I grew <laughs> up not using calculators, not using sure. much of computers. For me, it's always been handwritten. Yeah. Yep. So if you go into my office, you'll see like a big chart which mm -hmm. says one year goals. Ooh, amazing. And Thank you so years. much. Oh man, we're getting uh, Amazing. spoiled here, heavily exactly. spoiled. I gotta take my glasses off here, like I don't get steam in my face. Sure. Um. <laughs> so as long as the long-term goals align with your short-term and your and your daily goals, mm -hmm. I think you're you're in every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yum. And another way I, I align my this year goals is by making sure that my last year goals. Am I growing from the year before? Right. So for example, whatever I've done in 2018, how am I doing it better in 2019? Right, so you do a bit of a reflective exactly. process, obviously. And in real estate, I wear a lot of hats. Right. So I wear, like, you know, I'm selling real estate for a lot of investors. Mm -hmm. I'm um, uh, buying real estate for myself. I'm increasing my portfolio. Right. I'm also developing a lot. So for me, it's almost like what I've done in 2018, mm -hmm. how am I going to make sure that it's 2x, 3x, 4x in 2019? Right. And if you're, not comp and if you're not uh, growing from your previous goals, right. year over year over year, you're not growing, period. Right. Right. So in hindsight, you might think that you're doing really well, mm -hmm. but for me, it's all about growth. And right. that's how I've competed myself from 2010, when it's when I started in real estate, yeah, all the way ago. to 2019. There and you, you can go. look at my chart, it always has to be one step ahead of the last year that you've done. And if it's not, then it's, it's going to be a if change If it's not, in the then it obviously plan, needs, or? exactly, it obviously needs uh, some uh, inspection into like what I've done wrong and how I make sure that how I grow. And maybe a strategy needs changing. Yeah. But touch wood so far, uh, any goal that I've set for 2019 or 2020, it's right. always been in comparison to what I've done last year, how I'm going to make it better, and does it align with my five-year goals? Right, so you're always kind of calibrating that process, Absolutely. obviously. I love it. Well, let, let's dig in here, by Sounds the way. Good. Yeah. Um, I know it's uh, people get nervous about getting interviewed and eating, but uh, oh, yeah. this is something that it's too good to yeah. to uh, have under our, uh, our noses. So yeah, this is a place, awesome. by the way, that you that you, like. That you chose this place. So this is a, like a re, like your regular watering hole for uh, for clients. So dates. I'll tell you, Paul. I, I'm not um, I'm not a brand kind of restaurant guy. I'm a, I, uh -huh. I like the small family restaurants. Nice. Yeah. I always feel like they're a little bit more well managed, and the food really comes nice and fresh. Right. So this is one of the small Italian restaurants in Long Branch, uh -huh. a small community in South Etobicoke. Right here in and, Toronto, uh, Ontario. In Toronto, yeah. Ontario. And we don't have that many small restaurants like such as, um, you know, 850 or there's another one called Pulcinella, uh -huh. which is next door. Now, is that so a real estate problem? Huh? Is that a real estate issue? <laughs> it's a real estate problem and I think it's growing slowly. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Like there's new restaurants coming in, there's new run professionals coming in the area, seeing a big change. Totally. But this restaurant's been around for the last few years and I absolutely love the food here and I bring a lot of clients, mm. a lot of dates, a lot of like, you know, of it's, it's, it's a good place to hang out with friends. It makes an awesome place for brunch. And you know people yeah, everywhere, people, right? right? So it's here, a good exactly. community. That's actually an awesome segue again into a question mm -hmm. that I, I have on my mind around um, geolocation, right? I mean, you're in the real estate world. Mm -hmm. There's there's um, there's growing communities and there's a way that real estate actually uplift, uplifts a community, mm -hmm. whether it be commercial real estate, like a restaurant or a bunch of restaurants mm -hmm. or a high rise. How have you seen, which is one of the neighborhoods you're most excited about, if it's if it's this one or maybe another one, and what makes, what really makes the neighborhood something that is, uh, I guess, appealing for real estate and to live in? So, as an investor, I'm mm -hmm. always looking to invest in an area that's growing and not saturated. Right. So initially when I started investing, I was in North York, then I was in Beaches. Oh, interesting. Now I'm in the West End. So, that, so you've been following a bit of a trend there, huh? And I absolutely, I'm very biased because I live in Long Branch. Sure. But I also have more than $8 million invested in Long Branch. Sure. Because I believe in the area. Put your money where your, where your uh, exactly. mouth is, money right? There you go. Is, exactly. And uh, <laughs> so I have my office here, my, my house here, my investments here, mm -hmm. and tons and tons of clients that I'm driving into here. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I love about Long Branch is that the community is dominated by these Second World War 1950s bungalows, these really small Oh, bungalows. wow. Yeah. And logistically, it's one of the best neighborhoods because it's only about 15 to 20 minutes from downtown Toronto. And the best part close. about it, you're walking distance from the Lake Ontario. Yeah. So you have an awesome waterfront community here. Yeah, that you is nice. beautiful parks, you have mm. amazing access to highways, you're mm -hmm. close to downtown, mm -hmm. and the community is just starting to attract a lot of young professionals. Mm. As mm -hmm. the baby boomers are, are leaving their homes, Right. 
these young professionals are coming in wow. and it's starting to become a very very young professional small little community that's yeah. growing huh. which is why I love this area and it's absolutely my top favorite area mm -hmm. not only just to invest mm -hmm. but to live and I've been here for the last few years and I absolutely love living here that's great I mean yeah. coming from Vancouver I, need, I know I need my waterfront right so I think that's super key and have you seen any like actual big offices open up nearby or even other interesting restaurants that are really starting to show yeah, so you, how the community is evolving just if you look at where people are investing their money right like businesses absolutely you've got some amazing sushi restaurants that just came in you've got mm -hmm. um, in fact the other day I was doing a research thing like every single big restaurant from Nando's and W mm -hmm. of course McDonald's Every single thing is within a seven minute driving radius from this area. Because mm -hmm. Queen Queensway is loaded with this, with loaded with restaurants. And then you also have Sherway Gardens Mall, right. which is very close to here. Right. Um, and then you've got these little family restaurants such as Pulcinella, which uh -huh. is one of the famous Italian restaurants here. Okay. And uh, also you've got the Gazelli, which is the Middle Eastern restaurant. Okay. Oh, so wow. you've got these um, nice- Very diverse too, right? Very diverse. And they all do well. All uh -huh. the little family restaurants do well. And I think the community is all about promoting the community as well. Mm -hmm. As you can see, this restaurant 850 only uh, serves local beer. Yeah. So they've actually started branding it and they're only serving local beer. So I love that. Yeah, that's great. Right? So um, every time I have a client meeting or something, I'll encourage them to bring, bring them to these like, little restaurants. Mm, I love it. Mm -hmm. And the food is amazing, by the way. This Superman pizza is insane. Incredible, eh? Wow. <laughs> you just taste the bread. I can tell you're a foodie. Bread. Yeah, I do come from that world. Um, but I mean, what I love most about food is I was telling you, I think before we started rolling this, is just that it connects people. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a common bond, it tells a story. I mean, now I'm gonna start to segue into my, my Italy trip, but we'll see that for a rainy day. But it, it, it's great in the way it, it, it evokes memories and it makes people like really generally connect. That's um, amazing. But there's a problem with uh, eating out too much and that's related to my next question around personal finance, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you look at, um, especially on the mortgage end, right? Like what are the things that most matter? debt to income ratios and credit score pretty much yep. so there's how to make more money how to how to manage your expenses and then how to be organized to make sure you have all the right documents right Absolutely. so um, around personal finance um, what are the things you think people are most often overlooking whether it's spending habits not saving enough especially for a down payment let's talk about personal finance for the next decade like what are things people really are should be aware of or are already kind of dropping the ball on absolutely I think goes without saying in a city like Toronto the biggest issue is they're spending way too much on mortgages in terms of like their household debt right right a big chunk of that is going towards their household debt. So one of the biggest fault problems we're facing in Toronto today yeah and it's hard for people who are born here to compete with people from China or Saudi Arabia just coming and buying these properties cash yeah. Part of the reason why the properties are increasing so much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think it's very important, and this is when it comes to working with the right experts comes in, right? Right. When I meet a lot of my clients, they're so hung up on living in areas that are already very saturated and expensive. For example, everybody's hung up on getting a condo downtown. Everybody's hung up on mm. uh, living in Liberty Village or by mm. Young Street or uh -huh. Forest Hill. Right. This and that. I think the one way is to make sure you're not stretching yourself in a household debt to reduce that pressure. Right. Um, as much as I'm a believer of buying real estate, I'm only a believer of buying affordable real estate. Okay. And real estate that's going to uh, be a part of your life in terms of growth. Okay. Right? Right. So I think it's important that people overlook the, um, how should I call that, the status that comes with real estate. Right. Instead, look for very smart, emotional. smart logistics. Yeah. Like if you can commute 15 to 20 minutes more and buy something that's half the price of sure. downtown, yeah. do that because that'll put you in a better personal finance position. Mm -hmm. And I started with that. Mm -hmm. To a lot of people who are just starting out in real estate, I think it's a smart idea and the culture of roommating is starting to come in. Sure. The culture yeah. of joint ventures are coming in. Yeah. In which you mean like people buying real estate together? Together. Yeah. And rooming together. Right. And stuff like that. I sure. think it's an yeah. extremely smart idea. Yeah. It will really help your personal finance. It'll give you a lot more disposable income to spend towards other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think the, they're getting too caught up on buying expensive real estate. Right. And that's not letting them spend money anywhere else. And hence, putting way too much pressure on the disposable income towards housing. Right. right? There are ways, and obviously, I think uh, the culture of side hustle is coming up to be big. Sure, if Amazon stores, Uber drivers, Amazon you name it. or anything like that. I think it's the world of our online arbitrage. Yeah. If you are a professional working nine to five, mm -hmm. uh, there's always ways that you can do things without going up on the streets, and you can do things online. Right. I think there's so many channels that everybody can showcase their talent. Yeah. Everybody's good at something. I know a guy yeah. 
who is now uh, making almost, uh, I, I, there's a client who came to mm. me four or five years ago complaining about this personal finance. Yeah. And, and uh, he plays guitar. And right. I just met with him five, uh, two, year, uh, two months ago after yeah. five years and I'm like, how's it going? He's like, it's going great because I'm doing online guitar lessons. Oh, look at people. that. And he's making yeah. a crazy amount of money on YouTube. Wow. So I think there are ways to tackle personal finance by the way of increasing your income sure. and decreasing your debt by investing and buying smart stuff right. instead of obviously spending way too much. Which seems like the easy answer. Oh, it's downtown, it's convenient, it's, yeah, there's a bit of status with that. It's the status and I think people getting caught up in what everybody else is doing instead of taking the time to work with an expert sure. that can help you find better, cheaper, or better value alternatives. Well, 100%. And let's right? let's talk about those extras, right? right? I mean, you look at, of course, realtors, uh, mortgage agents, anyone professional service. I mean, there are some stigmas there, and probably rightfully so. And there's also some gold that people, I don't think, give them enough credit for. Um, but let's talk about, like, you know, if you're speaking to those professional service entrepreneurs, right? Right. Who do a lot of marketing online, do a lot of sales, for better or for worse. What are the things you think that people are maybe doing too much of as the people that are representing the industry and what are things they, 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 sh they should be doing more of as far as adding value to consumers? Um, I'd like to say one thing, like I want to call out a lot of people on social media. I think yeah. uh, in today's world, there's a lot of people who are, in, for example, in real estate that are not very good at real estate, right. but they're very good at doing social media. Sure. It's up to people to really identify the people who actually know exactly what they're doing in real estate sure. versus people who are very good at graphic designing and video content. Right. Right. So I would say focus on the quality of content. Uh huh. Like, uh, for example, podcasts like yours or right. Grant, a lot of people, you're inviting a lot of the experts that have done stuff. Right. And you're asking them the right questions, which are providing actually high content mm -hmm. to people that your listeners are listening to. Sure, sure. So it's also about identifying the right content mm -hmm. from just glittery content. Right. Right? It's like, uh, so uh, I would say do more and focus more on the right content through, I think today you can get some really good uh, access to some really good podcasts. Right. Uh, you can get access to some amazing online books. Mm -hmm. You can get access to some really, uh, you know, you can reach out to people on LinkedIn. You can reach out to people on Instagram or social sure. media, the people who've done it in their industry. Mm -hmm. So focus more on one-on-one -on -one networking, focus more on reaching out to the right people, mm -hmm. focus more on good quality content mm -hmm. instead of going for the flashy, glittery, non-content stuff right. out there. Right, so i.e. people that are, you know, just pure lifestyle shots or them with I, their I can, cereal in the yeah. morning or which lifestyle has, I mean, it kind of humanizes you, but if it's all lifestyle, yeah. then perhaps, yeah, as you said, there's no actual value to it, right? Um, so, okay, so basically people overbranding themselves and maybe not backing it up. And now for the consumers that are looking to decide between, you know, Miss Instagram 10,000 followers or Mr. whatever, um, who might still have some merit in what they do, mm -hmm. who says you can't do both, what's a way for them to qualify? Who is a genuine realtor or mortgage broker who's going to look up for my best interest and start to do things that I can't start to do online? Because you know the whole surge in technology now. So there's robo-advisors, it's a whole other topic, right? right? But as far as you know, what people, consumers should look for to really um, understand what's gonna give them the most value, who out of the many realtors or mortgage brokers or professional service folks, right. what do you think stands out as far as um, what so, is really worth hiring for? So in realtors, it's very simple. Uh -huh. if, and this is goes with the saying for anything you're doing in sales. Mm -hmm. If you're not a believer of your own product, mm -hmm. and if you're not a buyer of your own product, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be selling it. Right. If you are choosing a real estate agent, mm -hmm. But let's say, for example, if you're looking for an investor real estate agent, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the first question you should be asking a real estate agent is, how many properties do you own? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If the real estate agent himself is not investing in certain type of real estate, like my entire branding, my entire marketing, mm -hmm. is it revolves around all the properties that I buy for myself. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'll buy a property and then I'll tell people to buy the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm basically like I put my money where my mouth is kind mm -hmm. of real estate agent. Mm -hmm. And I encourage every single person to do that. Mm -hmm. If you're picking a real estate agent to sell your home in let's say North York, mm -hmm. find out how many properties do you own in North York or how many properties have you sold in North York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to determine an expert from a non-expert by just going in, digging in deep of how much they have actually bought their own product or how much have they sold to that same product and right. it comes with a lot of experience. Right. Because then they can truly understand and point you in the right direction through their own mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how I separate a good realtor from a non-realtor. Right, so practice what you preach. Exactly.
Exactly. And that I think goes for, and that comes back to Tony Robbins saying the yeah. same thing, right? Back in the day, he used to sell cassettes. And the first thing that he did was uh, mm. buy those cassettes and listen to them themselves to see how is this cassette providing me the value of right. his personal <laughs> development cassettes. And then it would be so much easier for him to go out there and sell them right. because he's a user of those cassettes. And right. he's a believer of those cassettes. Same exact thing applies to everybody who's yeah. selling a product online. Mm -hmm. Do you buy it yourself? Do you believe it in yourself? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a lot easier for people to trust you because right. you come from a place of credibility. Yeah, and it's actions versus words, mm -hmm. right? You're demolishing it, man. We're gonna to have to take some of this to go. I mean, we've been short on the on the beef ravioli. Yet. My God. Well, we're gonna be stuffing our face fully pretty soon. But let's have one more question for us to go full throttle on this. To level up. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? To level up. Am I more? Am I doing more than what I did yesterday? Mm -hmm. That's to me level up. And every morning, I wake up. And I ask myself one question without feeling the pressure to answer it. Mm -hmm. Am I doing something today that's better than what I've done yesterday? Mm -hmm. And I don't worry about answering that question. Mm -hmm. uh, don't put myself in a position to be under pressure to sit down and be like, okay, I gotta figure out this. Because your unconscious is figuring that out for you. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that you take the time to truly and genuinely ask yourself that question. Mm -hmm. Am I doing something better than I've done yesterday? Mm -hmm. Am I going than more than I've done yesterday? Mm -hmm. Everything's awesome. Everything's Thank you. fantastic so far. Thanks. And if you can wake up every morning and ask yourself that question, mm -hmm. it's cheesy, but the universe will answer it. Mm -hmm. You'll start seeing those answers different places. Sure. Every day that I've woken up and I'm asking myself that question, it's wow. giving me the power, it's giving me that unconscious to really go out there and mm -hmm. look for that answer. Mm -hmm. So ask yourself the question, even if you're not answering it that very day, right. the answers will start coming. But be genuine about it and go out there and be like, am I doing something today that's making me grow tomorrow? And once mm -hmm. you do that, you will start leveling up. I love it. That's yeah. a, an, an excellent definition. Uh, la actually, I lied. Last question here is, mm -hmm. is uh, as far as reading goes, we talked about some reading material and, yeah. and just some books uh, throughout today's um, lovely discussion with uh, amazing food. Um, are you more of a, an audio books person yes. or, a, or a you know physical books person? Absolutely audible. I have okay. zero attention span to sit there and read a book. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say that. And you're I'm, on the go all the time, so you, you know, it's practical. I'm on the go, it's playing in my car, if right. I'm traveling, it's playing in my headphones. Um, my goal is to read about one or uh, one book a week. Cool, wow, right? So I, I'm trying to get to that goal, but it'll end up being like one or two books a month. Um, Shoot for the stars, land on the moon, right? Personal development books, uh, yeah. interesting books, cool. entertaining books. The last book I read was uh, Blink from Malcolm Gladwell. Yes. One of my favorite books all time. Yes. It's the third time I'm reading it. Oh, cool. And there's also the book uh, related to that is uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, Dan Pink. He talks about system one, system two, the, basically those split decisions that are through fight or flight. It's also about or starting the more to trust ones. your instincts. Yeah. It's starting to trust your instincts. Like for me, like I'll do all the homework. Mm -hmm. When I see the right property and it, you just feel like it's the mm -hmm. right property and you don't question that. Mm -hmm. You just go ahead. Yeah. Because if you put all the work and you see something and your instincts tell you that's the way to go, mm -hmm. for me it's about being decisive as well and just mm -hmm. taking action. Yeah. Then you have to follow your instincts in order to take action. 100%. So if your instincts are telling you yes, don't mm -hmm. question it, do it. Mm -hmm. If your instincts are telling you no, don't do it. Now so the, me, I believe in that. Now Very the strong. other side to that though yeah. is that sometimes your instincts maybe preemptively have you, biased. you know, biased or go towards a certain direction, but then if you're like, it's kind of like being too impulsive and not thinking things through, it's almost the other side of that. Right. So is there a balance you where like, please? yes, please, is there a balance to like, okay, so instincts are telling me to do this, let's do it, versus instincts are telling me to go talk to that person who's clearly busy, but I know I should talk to them, so I'm gonna go. Like, at what point do you, does, does your kind of cognitive brain maybe redirect your impulses? I think that comes with a lot of experience. Right. Right, I've done door-to-door -door sales, I've done sure. phone call sales, I've done sitting and selling stocks, I've sure. sold jewelry, I've sold, I've, I've done everything under a book when it comes to sales. Uh -huh. So. Maybe uh, seven out of times you'll be right and three out of times you won't be right. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. to me, it's about taking that action of doing How it. do you get better every day? Exactly. You learn from that, you calibrate. Taking action, making decisions, following your instincts, and obviously doing all the due diligence to make sure that you can, in fact, trust those instincts. Mm -hmm. If your instincts are coming from a place of no experience and no knowledge sure. and no practice, then of course you gotta like question them. Right. But if you do it over and over again and it you start better. trusting those instincts, you'll get better at it. I love right? it. So that to me is uh, plays a huge role in my daily decision making. Yeah, it's huge. So and it's a, it's it's a, it's an art to master over time. Mm. You gotta be patient. 
on the topic of Malcolm Gladwell, mm -hmm. I actually gave away a buck to my last guest, Maria Criticos. And it was Outliers, which is personally my I've, favorite I've, of Malcolm Gladwell. That's my next book. It's okay, oh man, it, it's very different from Blink, but I, that I think and talking I to appreciate strangers. it. That's the book I'm reading right now. Okay. So Malcolm's great. Of course, he's uh, he's from Toronto. We will give him that shout out. That. He ran track and field with U of T, which I also run with U of T. I did not know that. Yeah, so he, he's a local guy, uh, amazing public speaker, and, and uh, of course, an incredible author. So I gifted to her the Outliers book. And uh, I, I want to get a more of a pulse on you today before I gifted you something, but I will send you an audio um, okay. book podcast or sorry, an actual audio book Done. based off today's conversation. So maybe the audience will be curious on what that book was and what your biggest insights were from it. So that's going to come your way. That's it for today, man. Thank you so much for um, distilling your wisdom, being really honest and raw, and doing it all while we have a bunch of pizza in front of us. I know it takes yeah, a lot of no, restraint. It's, so. it's a pleasure for me to be on your show. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. And uh, one of the advice for all the listeners is that you got to find guys like this who find the experts, who take the time to provide you guys with good content, who go through the effort of uh, you know doing the right research to get the right people. Because there can be hundreds of people out there that can be spitting a lot of knowledge but you got to like narrow it down and you also got to create a fun setting like this this is absolutely creative and cool. I, i'm glad you've had fun with it I'm this glad is awesome fun. man and i had a really good time chatting with you too well that's the most important yeah, part thanks absolutely. again man yeah my pleasure awesome yeah now we can dig good. in huh all right <laughs>